In-person school reopening. Below under the blueprint for a safer economy, red, orange, yellow, purple tiers are the requirements for schools already reopened and not yet opened. Under the updated guidance, all schools must now complete and post to their website a COVID-19 safety plan called the CSP. County schools that have already reopened are required to post the CSP by February 1 of 2021. Grades 7 through 12 in schools that have not yet reopened may not reopen if they're in the purple tier, although K through 6 may reopen if they develop a CSP and submit it to the local health officer with no deficiencies. The schools not yet reopened may reopen if they are in the yellow, red, and orange tiers, but they also must submit a CSP. The CSP has two components, the Cal OSHA Prevention Program, CPP, and the Cal COVID-19 School Guidance Checklist. For schools to reopen while the county remains in the purple tier, the case rate of COVID-19 must be at 25 or less per 100,000 people per day. This metric was initially 28 per 100,000, but was reduced a few days later when the Safe Schools for All guidance came out. Once the metric is reached, we may, we may begin in-person instruction for grades TK through 6. For grades 7 through 12, the case rate must be 7 or less per 100,000. This is a change to the process that was initially provided back in the fall from the state regarding the purple tier. Previously, the counties needed to meet the red tier metrics for of less than seven cases per 100,000 uh, for two weeks prior to moving into the red tier and then maintain those metrics for two weeks uh, before in-person instruction could begin. Once the current guidance and case rate metrics are met, the district can begin the process of re resuming in-person instruction. Uh, and that includes the posting of this and submission of the CSP for approval to the Riverside University Health System and the state schools for all team. This chart basically just kind of outlines uh, all of those metrics and all of those uh, things that I just mentioned. Uh, again, this can be referenced for each of the tiers, but we are talking specifically about the purple tier. The Department of Public Health has included specific guidelines for creating cohorts of students. These guidelines are for schools and child care and include schools and child care that are already open or yet to open. Because stable groups limit the chance of exposure to COVID-19, it also limits the possibility of a school-wide closure should an exposure take place. Cohorts are equal to no more than 14 children and two adults, and this cohort stays together for all activities, whether inside or outside of the classroom. Adults in a cohort are not to interact with any other cohorts. Challenges to cohort guidance include the small number of students in a cohort and the overall supervision by other adults on campus. Continuing with considerations for the district's reopening, there are some additional considerations that we must discuss. The requirement is that a district must continue to have as an option distance learning to continue. Currently, our data for elementary only is roughly at 3,800 students whose parents have elected that they will remain in a distance learning format for the remainder of the year. In addition, we have roughly 35 staff that must remain in a distance learning format due to their personal vulnerable um, category. These numbers continue to be fluid and changes are being made daily as parents and staff are reconsidering their choices. We've had to develop a procedure for selecting additional staff that will perform the distance learning format to meet the need of the number of students electing to stay in distance learning. In addition, we have started planning for our hybrid cohort implementation. We must develop a phase-in model that must be determined by grade spans. As a district, we could decide on a TKK starting first, then moving into first and second, and so on. As a district, we'll need to determine the length of time between each grade span before phasing in. Working in a hybrid or cohort model still requires that all instructional minutes for the grade level remain the same. We've developed a mechanism to track asynchronous minutes developed and implemented. 
Changing of class rosters at the elementary will be disruptive, however, it will be inevitable. Safety protocols remain in place for any face-to-face -face instruction. We must maintain the six feet social distancing. All staff and students in a face-to-face -face model must wear a face covering and frequent hand washing must be made a part of the day. We must also secure that our cohorts remain stable. This is very difficult and we will have to come up with a plan to determine how we will backfill if a teacher or paraeducator needs to be out. In addition, the district will also continue to work with all three of our bargaining units on the changing work conditions due to the reopening framework. These are just a few of the complex considerations the district is currently working through. The goal of these reopening guidelines is to reduce or ultimately eliminate in-school transmissions. Protecting the health and safety of our students, staff, and community is paramount when considering plans to reopen our schools. Several practices, such as the use of face coverings, hand washing, or among such practices consistently preached. The information provided on these next few slides encompasses layers of safety mitigation strategies. As one might imagine, implementing these practices strategically and as a matter of practice will increase the overall effectiveness of each. Mitigation strategies should be both practical and feasible, tailored to meet the needs of our students, staff, and community. Stable groups provide a key mitigation layer in schools. A stable group is a group with fixed membership that stays together without mixing with any other groups for any activities. Guidance from other agencies, including the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, sometimes refer to them as cohorts or pods. Implementing stable groups of students and staff reduces the numbers of exposed individuals if COVID-19 is introduced into the group, decreases opportunities for exposure to or transmission of the virus, facilitates more efficient contact tracing in the event of a positive case, and allows for targeted testing and quarantine of a small group instead of potential school-wide closures in the event of a positive case or cluster of cases. Stable groups or cohorts at the middle school level would require many adjustments to our current model. Students need to be placed in groups that will stay together all day. This would reduce the number of exposures to students and staff. This would require many students' schedules to change from their current assignments. Also, we need to create smaller groups or the hybrid model. Another requirement would be to have a staggering passing period. Middle school hallways do not permit one-way traffic or allow for social distancing of the number of students we have on our middle school campuses. Some schedule options include having a block schedule to reduce the number of classes and that, therefore reducing exposure to students and staff during the day. Also, elective work needs to be virtual so that students can participate in various programs. We also need to make sure that supported inclusion is on campus so that all students have access to the curriculum. As a middle school principal, middle school students often want to congregate, so it will be important to have campus supervisors making sure that students are rotating and keeping the proper social distancing, which can be difficult with middle school students. Ensuring social distancing during arrival and dismissal. Multiple arrival and dismissal locations throughout school campuses will be needed to accommodate different grade levels and to ensure students are safely accessing our campuses. For schools that do not have multiple locations, uh, possible staggering of arrival and departure schedules, again, depending on the need of the school site, will be necessary. Assign locations at arrival points for students who walk to school or ride their bikes or are dropped off by parents are needed to ensure social distancing prior to entering school campus. Multiple designated staging areas ensuring social distance for students prior to classroom entry will be necessary to ensure that students will be at least six feet apart from their classmates as well as six feet apart from the other students. 
Multiple designated staging areas will also be needed to ensure social distancing for students during dismissal. Again, ensuring proper six foot distance between students and between lines of students. Distance inside and outside of class. The first thing we need to think about is getting students to our schools. That happens via the buses. When we look at busing inside and out, we want to maximize the space between our students in the seats and in the areas that are open to ventilation. We want to make sure the windows stay open and that there's space for students within the bus. This may mean that we have two or three extra buses per route. We want to minimize adult contact before and after school with families, so students need to get right on the bus and get right off. Another great suggestion is to stagger the arrival and dismissal times, and if at all possible, use multiple drop-off and pick-up points. When we look at distance inside and outside of the classroom, it is suggested that we keep a distance between the desks and the chairs of six feet. However, we look to see that there is a good faith effort to comply. Not every classroom will have exactly six feet. However, every classroom cannot have any fewer than four feet. It's also required that we minimize face-to-face -face contact, and just like the buses, ventilation is essential. One other option is to optimize all of our outside space and any current space that isn't being used for classrooms, for example, teacher's lounges, can be used to optimize that space. Another thing to keep in mind is that the bodies of students are different. As a high school principal, I may have a 250 pound, six foot linebacker in my class that takes up a lot more space than a first grader. So what space looks like in each classroom and in each level may vary as well. The one thing to remember is that we have to have six feet of distance and no less than four feet. When we look at non-classroom space, we want to limit all non-essential visitors as well. We want to use that non-classroom space and even venture outside and hold classes outside. It's important to look at our traffic patterns in and out of buildings and for high schools in between floors. And we want to look at serving our meals outside. We want to utilize the inside space and outside space to maintain that distance and in all areas, keep ventilation and face-to-face -face contact from happening. Ventilation of classrooms, shared workspaces, buses, and wherever students and staff come together is an important element of the reopening guidelines. Putting measures and protocols in place for better ventilation, including additional operating hours for air exchange systems, opening windows wherever possible, and the use of outdoor instructional spaces. Buses are also recommended to have open windows during travel. The guidelines also suggest to avoid classrooms and other areas where outside air ventilation is not possible. We all know the importance of washing our hands to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Signage illustrating the importance and proper hand washing techniques are in place district-wide. The guidelines take hand hygiene to the next level by suggesting we not only ensure the proper supply of hand hygiene supplies, but also that all adults on school sites directly model hand washing and have students wash hands at staggered intervals every day. Adding staggered hand washing times in all classrooms will certainly add an additional important element into daily lesson planning. Students should also be explicitly taught to cover coughs and sneezes by, again, adults modeling the behavior themselves. Keeping our schools as safe as possible will be a multi-layered task. The guidelines define cleaning as the use of water, soap, and other products that significantly decrease germs on surfaces. Disinfecting is the process of using approved products to kill germs on surfaces. Frequently touched surfaces in classrooms and around campuses will need to be cleaned several times a day. In contrast to our current district plan, the guidelines call for cleaning over repeated disinfecting. According to the guidelines, 
Disinfecting should occur after a COVID exposure as opposed to repeated disinfectings. This contrast between our current plan and the guidelines will only make implementation more complex. As we look to reopen our schools, staff must not only continue the existing proactive process to screen the limited number of students and staff who have been on campus during the first semester, but these screenings must be expanded to include the larger numbers who will return to school for in-person instruction, causing a much more complex screening process. Currently, we utilize the Parent Square Daily Health Screening Tool for those staff members who report to work, but right now, we only have approximately 400 staff reporting to work each day. With approximately 3,000 staff members and 21,400 students enrolled who will be coming part-time, this will be a daunting task. To utilize the screening tool, as a reminder, staff utilize, can utilize any device to sign in and answer various questions to identify if they are sick, if they are presenting COVID-19 symptoms, or if they have recently come in close contact with a person with COVID-19. If that staff member identifies any of these conditions, they are directed to stay home that day, which, is a lot, which allows one of our school nurses to contact them and advise them of their next steps. Once this occurs, the nurse then works closely with the personnel office to document the absence and quarantine period if necessary. Currently, if potentially exposed, staff members have been directed to quarantine for 14 days. As schools reopen, a student and or staff member may present COVID-related symptoms. When this occurs, just like now, the individual must be excluded from returning to campus until testing results are known. If a COVID diagnosis does occur, the individual must quarantine for at least 10 days since the first symptoms occurred until the symptoms have improved and the fever has passed for 24 hours. As outlined in the presentation today, we must remain diligent to following the safety and, gui safety and health guidelines while being cognizant of the fact many students and staff may have to be quarantined per the county health directives. We must remain extremely focused to keeping our students and staff safe. Over the holiday break, many individuals gathered and as a result, our district, much like the entire county, experienced an incredible surge in the number of individuals who were sick from the virus or were quarantined from their workday. Thus, as we look to bring thousands of individuals together on our school sites and in our offices, we will have to remain diligent on the following things. Regarding interactions while on campus, we will have to maintain our commitment to social distancing. We will have to wear our masks. We will have to continue to quarantine individuals for the recommended time periods when necessary. And lastly, we will continue to recommend that all staff meetings and professional development continue in a virtual setting. But if these activities are to be in person, they must support social distancing. Regarding the sharing of items, we will suspend all activities that require, that require the sharing of items to the greatest extent possible, such as drinking fountains or electronic devices, clothing, toys, games, and or art supplies, just to name a few. For the most part, we must ensure that we have adequate supplies to minimize the sharing. When items are shared, we will have to clean any shared object between use. Training and maintenance of uh, healthy operations. Just a couple of key points I want to touch on in regards to training. Make sure that we continue to use our face coverings and that those are, if you use on a daily basis, make sure we wash those on a regular basis um, and also keep the same same side face out and so forth. Um, also with physical distancing, staying at least six feet apart. Sanitation practices, make sure we're washing our hands often and cleaning those high touch areas. And it's also the importance of understanding COVID symptoms. We want to make sure that we're identifying those, a fever, cough, and so forth. So we want to make sure that we're uh, well aware of those. In healthy operations, we want to make sure that we monitor absentees, the staff, and also students, and of course students and their siblings. Uh, we want to make sure we keep a good record of those. Monitoring symptoms, we want to make sure those, those that have symptoms that are isolated uh, in an area, whether it be a tent, gym, wherever the case may be, and also doing daily temperature checks. Communications right now, currently we're using our uh, parent square. We want to continue to use that. We also have a website. There's also a lot of data on there and also school health clerk is also a great resource. In addition to that, uh, lastly, we want to make sure we're supporting those students that are higher risk, make sure we're continuing with our distance learning and providing them with the best education possible.
Knowing the difference between a confirmed case and a probable case of COVID-19 is essential for once we reopen. Here are the defined terms for both confirmed and probable cases. We will use these definitions as we move forward with our reopening plan. What do we do if there is a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 in a school? This chart illustrates the four most likely scenarios and how a district will need to respond to the exposure and also makes recommendations on how and when to communicate with the community at large. School districts will be working collaboratively with the local health department in responding to COVID-19 positive cases. In most situations, the school will be notified of a positive case directly by the infected employee or by the parent of an infected student. In some cases, we will be notified for the first time by the local health department. Upon notification of a positive case, an interview will be conducted to determine if the case was infectious while at school, and if so, close contacts will be identified. If the case is a student, close contacts will likely include the entire class, as it may be difficult to determine which students may have been in close contact, meaning they had interaction with a case for a cumulative 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period at less than six feet. Once identified, close contacts will be instructed to quarantine and testing will be recommended. If a close contact tests negative, they will still be required to complete the entire quarantine period. If a close contact tests positive, they will need to isolate for 10 days before returning to school. The priority is to identify and quarantine close contacts quickly to prevent any further spread of infection, and while doing so, be able to identify any in-school transmission or if school-related factors contributed to the infection. If deficiencies are identified, schools will work with the Public Health Department to modify policies to prevent a reoccurrence. Collective protocols for COVID-19 will be attached to this presentation. School actions that must be taken when there is a confirmed or suspected COVID-19 case include adhering to reporting requirements and notifying the local health department of any new reported cases of COVID-19 unless the local health department has already contacted the school about the case. If the person is present at school at the time the school is notified, the case must be sent home and be excluded from school for at least 10 days from symptom onset date or if asymptomatic. 10 days from the date the specimen was collected for the positive test. They'll send a notice developed in collaboration with the local health department to parents and staff to inform them that a case of COVID-19 has been reported and that the school will work with the local health department to notify any exposed people. Arrange for the cleaning and disinfection of the classroom and primary spaces where the person spent significant time. This does not need to be done until students and staff in the area have left for the day. They'll also implement online and distance learning courses for the student if the student is well enough to complete the courses. When either a school or local health department is aware that an outbreak may be underway, the local health department should investigate in collaboration with the school to determine whether these cases had a common exposure. Examples of common exposure could be common classroom, bus ride, or staff member. The objectives of the school outbreak investigation are to identify and isolate all cases, quarantine and test contacts to prevent further transmission. In addition, to understand the circumstances that may have allowed for transmission in the school setting and to identify and strengthen strategies to prevent further outbreaks. The detailed steps that school and local health departments must follow during the investigation process can be found on page 35 and 36. What are the criteria for closing a school to in-person learning? Individual school closure in which all students and staff are not on campus is recommended based on the number of cases and stable groups impacted, which can suggest that there is an active in-school transmission occurring. All closures should be done in consultation with the local health department. Situations that may indicate the need for a school closure are listed in this slide. If a school is closed, when may it reopen? Schools may typically reopen after 14 days and if the following events have occurred. 
cleaning and disinfection, a public health investigation, and consultation with the local health department. School testing provides us with the tool to support safe and successful in-person instruction. There are several types of testing. Symptomatic testing is used for individuals with COVID-19 symptoms, whether those symptoms present themselves at home or at school. Response testing is used to identify positive individuals once a case has been identified. Response testing is provided for both symptomatic or asymptomatic individuals with known or suspected exposure to an infected individual. Asymptomatic testing is used for surveillance. It allows us to be proactive and guides decisions related to safety within our schools. There are many challenges though related to testing. How do we test students? How do we get permission to test students? Who will perform the testing services? All districts in the state of California will be looking to procure testing services. Will there be sufficient supply for the demand? When will we receive the results from testing? Will it be timely enough to guide our decision-making process? Who will track the testing of staff and students? Our nurses are currently doing an incredible job of following up on staff daily health screenings. However, we do not have an adequate internal system nor personnel to track who is tested, who hasn't tested, as well as tracking the results of the testing for both staff and students upon their return. The cost of testing is an added complexity. It would cost the full allocation of funds provided by the state to reopen schools and then some. Vaccines for K-12 schools. The state believes that the COVID-19 vaccination is one of the most important tools to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Information on vac vaccines is rapidly evolving. The California Department of Public Health recommends all eligible people receive the vaccine. We are currently in groups 1A and 1B tier one who are eligible. Those groups include educators. There is no vaccine at this time available for people under the age of 16. California Department of Public Health is strongly recommending that the flu vaccine given every fall be added to the required school vaccine. Once a week, the federal government announces anticipated allocation figures for each state. It is difficult at this time to get an appointment. There is speculation and or confusion on how money should be spent on vaccinations or on testing. Vaccine website links for information are updated. There's a live link in the presentation. Challenges in returning to school include having enough teachers with some being quarantined, sick, and or caregivers of family members, and the possibility of substitutes contaminating a stable group. This leads us to a discussion regarding the COVID-19 school guidance checklist. There are some complexities with the checklist that require some attention. For example, LAUSD will need to identify a proposed reopening date and which grade or grades would be affected. Another complexity is that any LEA in the purple, like LAUSD, will be required to submit additional documentation to the local health officer Riverside County of Education, and the state school safety team prior to reopening. Additionally, one last hurdle is that districts in Riverside County with a case rate greater than 25 to 100,000 cases will be allowed to submit the materials but cannot reopen a school until Riverside County is below 25 cases per 100,000 for five consecutive days. Finally, the district will need to complete the checklist, receive approval, and post to the district website. This page reinforces and outlines the commitments that our district must confirm. As identified on this page, the district must ensure stable groups where applicable. In prior guidance, this has been commonly referred to as not mixing cohorts. To support these stable cohorts, the district has identified the following student schedules. Elementary students will attend in-person instruction at either a morning or afternoon session with the same students five days a week. Secondary students will attend specific days of in-person instruction with the same students. We must also ensure ingress and egress 
as well as movement within the school. A plan must be identified to avoid or limit the amount of close contact and or mixing of these cohorts. We also must ensure face coverings and protective gear are worn by all students and staff when applicable. We also must ensure daily health screenings of students and staff and take necessary steps to quarantine or exclude individuals. We also must maintain healthy hygiene practices where students and staff develop routines and are frequently reminded to wash their hands and or utilize hand sanitizers. We also must implement a plan to identify and trace confirmed COVID contacts to provide county health officials the names of those who have been exposed. Specifically, staff must identify one person who will continue to be the notification person for the county health department, currently being done by one of our school nurses. And lastly, we must ensure safe physical distancing. We must continue to provide a plan six feet of minimum space between students and classrooms and provide an explanation if this cannot be maintained. As we prepare to move towards phase two of the LUSD reopening plan for schools, approximately 50% of our students would be returning to campus for in-person instruction as designated by parent survey results. Staff and families for those returning to campus would need to be educated on several health and safety protocols related to COVID-19. Included in these protocols are the proper use, removal, and washing of face coverings, physical distancing guidelines, how COVID-19 is spread, and identifying specific symptoms, the importance of not coming onto campus if sick, been in contact, or diagnosed with COVID-19. CDC has outlined specific steps for use, removal, and washing of face coverings, symptoms for two to 14 days of exposure, and how the virus is spread. All this information can be found on CDC's website. Education of parents and families through the virtual format of Zoom meetings, Parent Square, and other means of instructions will be critical to inform the community of how the virus is spread and the importance of following all safety measures prior to the reopening of our schools. Similarly, the training of our staff on campus through the virtual format of Zoom meetings and other means of instruction will help to ensure that the health and safety measures are in place at our school sites. An additional requirement of the guidance checklist is to have a plan in place for testing of all staff and students that will be participating in face-to-face -face instruction. There is a different testing cadence depending on the tier our county is in at the time of our school's reopening. The most restrictive tier, Deep Purple, has a case rate above 14 cases per 100,000. This requires weekly symptomatic testing of all staff and students. The second restrictive tier, purple, with a case rate of 13.9 to 7 per 100,000, requires testing of all staff and students every two weeks. When reaching the red tier, with a case rate of 7 to 4 cases per 100,000, the testing cadence remains at every two weeks for all students and staff. The testing implications are complex. The district is actively planning and being proactive. However, the plan has not been passed or approved by our legislature yet. However, we cannot wait until that time that it is to begin the planning. The district must secure an outside agency that can ensure the testing frequency cadence and the return timelines for results. The tracking of students and staff is a requirement. We must track test results, positive case rates, quarantine timelines, providing required notification and communication to expose staff and students. All of this will require additional staff to ensure we meet these notification deadlines. Keeping cohorts stable will be challenging when staff are absent and substitutes are required to enter a stable cohort. There are strict guidelines that must be followed in regards to a cohort having a positive case 
and what students and staff may have to revert back to distance learning for a determined amount of time. These are some of the complexities that come out of testing staff and students. Our district will work with Riverside University Health Nurses to identify and report any known or suspected cases of COVID-19. Here at the district, we utilize ParentSquare to communicate with our students, staff, and parents, and will continue to use it as our main communication tool. The reopening of schools needs to be negotiated with our bargaining units, and that is a process that takes time as we flesh out the details of a plan. Communicating with our parents and community is done through our various parent groups, such as our PTA, LCAP committee, and other parent committees. This can prove to be complicated at this time since we cannot meet face to face and there are varying levels of comfort with video conferencing applications. As a district, we will work closely with Dr. Kaiser, our local health officer, as we monitor our county's movement through the tiers and the impact that this movement has on our reopening considerations.